Welcome to the German Marshall Fund of the United States. My name is Heather Conley. I'm president, and I am so very pleased to warmly welcome the mayor of Warsaw, Poland, Rafael Trzaskowski, to Washington. Warsaw is one of 12 cities in GMF's Cities Fortifying Democracy Project, which believes that we can strengthen democracy through engagement at the local level. Mayor Tchaikovsky is a strong believer that cities can uniquely drive transparency, accountability, and support human rights, particularly for a new generation of citizens. It's not surprising that along with the mayors of Budapest, Prague, and Bratislava, the mayor signed in 2018 the Pact of Free Cities to promote the common values of freedom, human dignity, democracy, equality, and the rule of law as a governing framework. Mayor Tchaikovsky has been mayor since 2018 and was the Civic Platform's presidential candidate in 2020. He has a distinguished record as a public servant, having previously served as a member of the Polish Parliament and the European Parliament. But Warsaw isn't just known as a city that fortifies democracy. It is a city that has absorbed over 300,000 Ukrainian refugees over the past two months. We have witnessed Polish citizens welcoming these refugees at train stations, in their homes, churches, schools, and throughout their community life. And I am sure we'll hear more about the extraordinary scale of this task and the generosity of the Polish people, but also the extraordinary need to support these refugees who are predominantly women and children, particularly their educational needs. Perhaps we should temporarily change the name of our program to Extraordinary Cities Exemplifying Solidarity and Generosity. So welcome to Washington, Mayor Tchaikovsky, and thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to turn this conversation over to my colleague, Laura Thornton, the director of GMF's Alliance for Securing Democracy, to begin this important conversation. Laura. Thank you so much, Heather. And it's, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time to come over to GMF to talk with us. As Heather had discussed, uh, one of the things, and I've been a big fan of your career, and particularly your work in local governance. So I thought perhaps we could start there. And I'd really like to have you reflect a little bit on your experience in advancing this liberal democratic proje project at the city level, particularly when we're seeing national challenges to democracy in Poland and elsewhere and rising illiberalism. So how have you carved out a space for yourself in Warsaw in this environment? How have you navigated these conflicts with the central government? And how is your pact of free cities, that partnership, like how does that help in your efforts? First of all, hello, thank you for having me at uh, the German Marshall Fund. Uh, and of course, this is very important to talk about the role of the cities because at the end of the day, uh, this is like a lab of, of change, uh, a city in Poland, a capital city, when it comes to promoting values which are very important to us, such as inclusiveness, such as transparency, such as tolerance. And I was always trying to convince uh, uh, the people of Warsaw, but also the people of Poland, that we do have uh, all of those values in our DNA, especially when it comes to to Warsaw, which before the Second World War was one of the most multicultural cities in the world, and which has always been open, which has always been proud of its tradition, but also looking into the future. And I would submit to you that most of the challenges that are so important for us, such as uh, fighting climate change, such as investing in uh, innovative solutions, such as bringing participatory democracy uh, into practice, that all of these things can be done on the levels of cities much more quickly and more effectively than on a national level. That's why being a mayor of Warsaw is so incredibly satisfying. It's interesting too, I mean, I've worked, I worked 25 years overseas with democracy organizations and I loved working with local government and cities in particular. And not only because of the innovation and maybe more flexibility that like local councils have compared to like a calcified parliament, but also because you can see ripple effects. I was wondering how you see what you're doing in Warsaw as impacting other cities across Poland, or maybe even trickling upwards to change behavior above you, you know, at the national level. Yeah, the most important thing is that you know, I was a member of the national parliament of the European parliament. I was a minister both of administration and digitization and then of the European affairs 
But when you're mayor, you see the effects of your work instantly, immediately. And, and, and you work with the people. You work on the ground, which is incredibly satisfying. And yes, I think that what we do in Warsaw, what we do in, in our partner cities in Poland and in Europe, uh, can serve as an example mm -hmm. and can galvanize public opinion, can address the questions that are so important with, uh, with uh, solutions that change life. Let me give you two examples. One is that I started my campaign for mayor with women's rights because we thought that we need to do something uh, uh, addressing uh, the problem in a, a country which is run by a very populist government. And we were able to actually introduce changes that really change the lives of the people for the better. For example, I've introduced this program of, uh, of uh, free uh, preschools, which meant that, that women uh, were able to actually get back to the, to the, to the, to the, work, uh, to the workplace much more quickly. Secondly, when we fight climate change, we started fighting and, and changing the, the coal power stoves in, in Warsaw. And it turned out that not only we were changing the landscape of the city and not, not only we were more effective uh, fighting climate change, but it turned out that in one of the poorest districts of Warsaw, when we started connecting apartments to heating systems, the educational scores went up. Hmm. We thought that the district that I'm talking about, which is Praga district, that the educational scores for young children were lower because simply the district was poorer and, and there were more uh, disfavored people living there. But it turned out that most of the kids were simply cold and they were missing school. Yeah. And just by addressing that question, uh, we were challenging some of the most established stereotypes about my city. And of course, that is also uh, an example for others to follow that we cannot just pay lip service to fighting climate change, but we need to do something about it. And have you seen other cities adopt what you've, what you've uh, started in Warsaw? Yes, because somehow populists do not win cities. Yeah, I've heard you say that. And, uh, and, it, and it is true. And uh, uh, most of Polish cities are run by progressive mayors. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about big cities only. I'm talking about cities as such who adopt progressive policies, who are open, who are transparent, who are tolerant, who look into the future and most importantly, who are accountable to the people. Because at the end of the day, we walk the streets of our cities every day, and it's impossible not to have ready answers to, to the people who simply uh, stop by and ask you questions, why are you doing something, or more importantly, why are, aren't you doing something? And cities, yes, cities in, 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 in uh, Poland, but also in Europe, follow the examples of, of their local leaders. It is much easier to influence the awareness of the people uh, of the most important challenges that are before us. And it's true about Europe as well. We, we collaborate, we create those networks of cities in Europe and, and we are very effective at, at promoting the values that, that we hold dear. But also thanks to uh, Mike Bloomberg, uh, we uh, participate in this program, Bloomberg Harvard program for mayors, NBA for, for mayors, and we were able to create a network uh, of contacts with our colleagues here in the United States. And it was incredibly important to be able to exchange um, experiences and, and to be able to tackle um, those challenges together in a much more informed way. You know, when you said, uh, and I've heard you say this before, that you know these far-right populists or illiberal populists don't win cities. They are, however, making some inroads. Uh, in rural areas in particular, not just in Poland. I mean, I, we can speak about the United States as well. What, what do you think are some of the ways we can bridge that? I mean, there are many demographic divides, but what, what are some ways we can bridge this uh, urban, rural divide that we're seeing in so many places? And, and particularly where that divide falls on democracy uh, and, and values. Um, do you have any lessons there? Well, the most important thing is talk, talk to people. And of course, you know, every politician talks about it, but when you're mayor, you're really on, on, on the ground talking to people and trying to convince them that, that at the end of the day, uh, this is, you're not just talking about values, but you're talking about the effectiveness of public institutions, uh, that you're talking about really resolving people's problems, and that 
as mayors, we are progressive, not in a way that you know, our, our ideals are progressive, mm -hmm. but that we are, in a sense, forced into dealing with some of the most important challenges of the future. Because if our cities do not change quicker, then we are not uh, acting as a magnet for the people. And of course, every city wants to be a magnet for the people because it wants to develop in a way which is, which is quicker and, and which is favorable to our citizens. So that really works miracles because every politician tells you, you know, we need to talk to, to the people, but most of them do it just throughout their electoral campaigns, whereas we do it every day. Uh, and even if, you, if, 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 if there is a mayor who doesn't like it, he's forced to do it, and that's always good for politics. And that's why it is very important to also invest in participatory politics in, 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 for example, citizens budgeting, where citizens can actually choose the projects that then uh, the city hall is realizing into making awareness campaigns about minority issues. And it's especially important in this very difficult day and age where populist governments, central governments, uh, sometimes attack minorities. They, mm -hmm. they, they do not recognize the importance of women's rights. They, like in Poland, they attacked the LGBTQ com community. And it's, it, it's important to ad address these questions. At, at the end of, of the day, you know, I have a daughter who's 17, and, and, and she tells me that uh, uh, I'm one of the few politicians that, 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 she, uh, that she is not afraid of, of, of talking about. Be be because at the end of the day, you know, kids and younger voters see that we are about something, that we are not ju just there to be elected for another office. Uh, and that, of course, uh, allows us to be much more effective. And I've heard you use this word, intentional democracy, that, you know, every day you wake up and you are intentionally sort of stitching democracy into everything you do. Could you describe a little bit wh what you mean by that, what that looks like? Well, unfortunately, uh, populism is on the rise everywhere. And even in the United States of America, after what happened uh, more than a year ago, it is easier to talk t to my friends because, you know, three years ago they were saying, like, come on, if there is a strong democratic state, uh, democracy is, is, is always winning. Uh, and maybe you have problems in Poland or in Hungary because you're not really mature democracies. And I was telling them that's not true. It's just that in today's world it is much easier to be a populist mm -hmm. because it is much easier to sell your populist slogans in 30 seconds or on, on, on social media where we are closed in our bubbles. And our job is to destroy those bubbles because you will never be elected on a local level if you do not address the people uh, across the aisle who, who, who think differently. So that's why sometimes values are slogans for national politicians. They pay lip service to them, but they don't do much about, about uh, employing them in practice where we've got no choice. When we talk about openness and transparency, we need to practice what we preach. Uh, because uh, people will tell us in a, in a, in a moment that, that, that we are not uh, staying true to our word. Uh, so we're translating these values into very concrete undertakings. So when we talk about women's rights, we, we just do not talk about it. Mm -hmm. We open preschools right. or we work for equal pay for work. When we uh, talk about uh, supporting minorities, that means we are with minorities and, and, and we are helping them, them out. I always say that this is a job of a mayor to help all of those who are disprivileged, who are in need of a help, uh, because that's what you do. I mean, th those who get by, you just make their life a bit easier, but th the most important thing is that, that you are helping hand to all of those who need assistance. So, so, so I would submit to you that we simply practice what we preach. I think your point, and it's something that we struggle with as, as a democracy organization, about the ability for strong men to really use simplicity. And that's uh, that it, to just come up with easy villains and stoke fear on sort of simple slogans. And that making a case for democracy more broadly can be more complicated. But like you said, if you're if you're grounding it in the actual acts that you're delivering, it, it can make it, you know, more beneficial, and you sell the idea better that way. Uh, it's something that you're right. We're all struggling with a little bit, including here in the United States. Um, you know, it it leads me to some other questions about how we can work together 
sort of across countries? Like what, 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 you, what can your allies in Europe help you with? And what, what can folks in the United States and organizations here help? How can we learn from each other and, uh, and make, defend democracy more broadly? Well, first of all, exchange of experiences and benchmarking uh, and uh, working with data it is so important. And at the end of the day, you know, when you see uh, certain solutions that were employed in different cities, mm -hmm. uh, we can learn so much from one another. And we can learn from our European allies, but we can also work with, uh, with our American colleagues. Uh, let me give you an example. We uh, were looking at the experience of different American cities with blight. This is not a European problem. But by seeing how our colleagues in the U.S. Uh, actually approach that problem, by breaking the silos mentality of different departments of their city and by, by trying to deal with a problem uh, across different issues uh, and basing your information on data uh, and producing innovative solutions helped us in dealing with completely different problems, but which were plagued exactly with the same problem of silos mentality, uh, being people being locked in their in their in their departments. Uh, so this is very very important. But also, uh, it allows you to look at the best examples because uh, some cities are progressive or innovative on completely different issues uh, than others. Uh, and, and simply at, at, at doing things together. And of course, that's why we set up uh, a, a Pact of Free Cities. First of all, the four Visegrad countries uh, uh, and capital cities, but then we've enlarged it to, to, to London, Los Angeles, Paris, uh, uh, Firenze, Milano, and so on and so forth. There's so much that we can learn from one another. And of course, it, it also broadens your horizons. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's 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 really uh, uh, exciting. Uh, at and the at the end of the day, you know, when I come back from some of those meetings or simply we have them online, uh, I'm always pushed to seek for 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 innovative solutions and 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 being effective on the ground. I really feel that, and I know some organizations do this, but having that clearinghouse of best practice is extremely useful, even if it can't, like you say, be applied you know, exactly in the same way in each place, but the process. Sure. One of the things that the organization within GMF that I manage, which is the Alliance for Securing Democracy, we look at autocratic threats to democracy, particularly from foreign actors. Mm -hmm. And you sort of mentioned the bubbles and the silos, and one of the biggest challenges to democracy, I don't need to tell you, is the information space. And, you know, we're all struggling with figuring out solutions to that, whether we go up tackle sort of the platforms or the technology. I have always been sort of of the mind that we need to bolster citizen resilience. And, and are there any lessons you've learned from sort of the perspective of a mayor to s enhance and inoculate your citizenry against this info warfare? And how can we sort of build people's discerning nature, if that makes sense? Uh, when, when she was 14 and I was running for, for mayor, uh, she suddenly calls me from the other room and she says, uh, Dad, you were right. They're lying on Polish TV. And I said, what did they say? And she said, they said that you were young. <laughs> but of course, we are confronted. But, but of course, we are confronted. We, we are confronted all the time with lies and propaganda and manipulation. Sometimes it's, uh, in the Polish case, it's done by the, uh, something which used to be called public media, but now it's party media. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's even Russian influenced. Uh, for example, all of those uh, sites that were anti-vaccine now are anti-Ukraine in, in, in Poland. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the populist government in Poland, just like in Hungary, they were attacking all the minorities. Uh, a few years back, they were attacking refugees and trying to vilify them. Then they were attacking the LGBT community. They were attacking uh, single mothers. Uh, they were depriving all the non-governmental organizations from financing. Exactly the same non-governmental organizations that now save our day in times of crisis. Because what you see in Poland uh, is, is, is the solidarity in our, in our DNA, but, but this is 
civil society, this is non-government organizations and, and local governments and mayors which are on the front line. It's the volunteers, it's the charities, and, and of course all the populists fight with them. So this is incredibly important to, to keep on supporting them because those are the people who do a lot of good, and, and that's your answer to it. But also when it comes to uh, disinformation, it is very important simply to uh, include it in our educational curriculum. And of course the national government doesn't want that, and, and we have this law which was just about to bar all the NGOs from entering schools, and fortunately our president who is the president connected to the ruling party who was smart enough to veto it. And he said that the winning argument that also I presented to him was that we will be not able, we would not be able to deal with the refugee crisis in schools and education without NGOs working with our kids. And for example, we've introduced those special programs, voluntary programs for kids and teachers to talk about openness, to mm -hmm. talk about uh, transparency and talk, to talk about tolerance. Uh, what to do if you're attacked, what to do if you're ridiculed, but to explain to, to, to kids that uh, if you're aggressive online, that it has a bearing on normal life, that, that, that this is just like insulting someone in real life. And, and to inoculate them to, to, to propaganda, to tell them that, that what they see in their Twitter or TikTok or Facebook bubble mm -hmm. is not necessarily true, that they need to reach out, that they need to look for alternative sources of information, that they shouldn't believe to whatever they hear or, 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 or to whatever they, they see, and that they have to, and this is the most important thing, stand up to bullies whoever they might be. Sometimes it's the governmental party, sometimes it's your colleague at school who is doing something online. But this is incredibly important that we talk to kids about issues like these. And it's, it's so true when you speak of your, your, your daughter and my children as well. And I try, you know, I try to raise them to be discerning. And we've had multiple conversations about checking your sources and you know, how to do due diligence in your research, and yet still, you know, they'll see something on TikTok and believe some craziness about a vaccine or, or whatnot. So it is going to be the challenge of our, <laughs> our lifetime is to break that I, down. I always tell my, my, my kids a story. When I was writing my, my first uh, master thesis, it was in uh, 1991. Uh, and I was writing about foreign policy of the European Union. And I had to, like, make phone calls and visit different cities in order to get the the position of the government of France on something. You know, I had to call researchers and so on. And it was very difficult to access information. <laughs> Later on, I was writing a second master thesis in 96, and the internet started, started um, uh, being used by researchers, but the uh, uh, search engines were terrible. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult to find the right information. And then when I was writing my PhD, internet was there, and it was a completely different set of skills that I needed. Mm -hmm not getting information, but yeah. sifting through, through lies, manipulation, or one-sided uh, one uh, uh, information, a and then, yes, verifying the sources. And I always tell my kids, you know, and my students, because uh, I'm a university professor, and I always tell them, listen, uh, Google is not the only source of your information. <laughs> Facebook is, is not a source of law. Uh, you need to verify your sources. And, and of course, you know, my father taught me, uh, I'm, I'm crazy about books and I own 12,000 books. And always, you know, people come to my home and to my office and they say, have you read them all? And I say, no, but I need them. Wh why, do you have, <laughs> why do you have 30 biographies of Stalin? Because I want to compare. You know, there's one which is written in the best way so we can read it all, but then if something interests you or you're not sure, you can compare the info, you can seek for different perspectives. And you want to read young Stalin you want to get his you know early childhood growing up in gory um, yeah book. it's amazing yeah your house sounds like mine but you're absolutely right I, I mean i went to school i guess around the same time you did and i described the library experience to my children they're like okay boomer you know, <laughs> don't tell us about libraries again but i think it points to the you know i, I recently was writing a piece about how there's this almost disdain for what's happening within Russia about disinformation. We can't believe it. They're buying Putin's lies. And I'm like, what's our excuse? Like, we're surrounded by information, almost maybe so much, like you said, that it becomes less 
ha not having it, but how to filter through it. I'm going to give you two examples from my presidential campaign. I've signed uh, the LGBT charter as the first mayor in, in, in Poland. And what the government did and its, and its uh, propaganda machinery, they uh, looked into the charter and I said that we are going to uh, look at the WHO standards, World Health Organization, when it comes to dealing with, with, with uh, the questions of exclusion. So what they did, they took a booklet published by World Health Organization, which was written by experts for teachers, mm -hmm. and was explaining the children's development, that the children get interested in their bodies when they're 8 or 10, they start masturbating when they're 11, and so on and so forth. And for three weeks, they were saying on national TV that I want to teach masturbation to children <laughs> at schools. And of course, everyone in Warsaw, Poznan, and Wrocław Gdańsk was one of the best jokes, because of course, it's so unreal. But people in, 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 in uh, rural areas actually believed in it. And when I was there, they were shouting at me, you're not going to teach our kids, are you crazy, and so on. And of course, I was explaining what was happening. Uh, and the second one was that they somehow checked that uh, I was seen as quite popular and maybe even looking better than the president and so on and so forth. So second news of the day, they took a tweet of an unknown person saying that I'm a midget. And they started making this campaign that I'm, you know, much, much shorter than I am. Everyone was like, why, why are they doing it? Because, because you know, it's just, yeah, it's, and yeah, but so what? I mean, and they exactly. were doing it and, and, you know, like in my electorate, no one believed in a story about masturbation and so on because it was so preposterous. But wherever I go, people tell me like, oh, you're, you're so tall. tall. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, the, they are doing it on a purpose. And of course, we need to learn and we need to teach our uh, our children, most importantly, but but also uh, we need to, to to learn ourselves how these uh, campaigns uh, are effective. And of course, today look at what Russia does in Ukraine. Uh, but Russia was meddling in American elections. It was meddling in our elections. It was med wherever they see a possibility for spreading mischief and lies, they're doing it. Uh, in Catalonia, when it comes to anti-vaccination campaign and so on. So we, we need to know that whatever we hear, whatever we see, needs to be corroborated. It, it needs to be checked. Uh, and and, and that's, that's, that's what we're doing also in the city, trying to teach people that, that, you know, just don't believe whatever you see. And this is not just a modern problem. Mm -mm. There was this, there was this, this uh, film, uh, Wag the Dog. Yeah. Uh, where they, you know, that they started uh, the, this 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 war, th this distraction, this mm -hmm. war that never happened mm -hmm. in a studio, and so on and so forth, and and everyone was like, oh, so crazy, but so true. But then I've read in American history books that actually, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, I think when Theodore Roosevelt was president, they did this mock war with with Mexico, just you know to start a skirmish, actually uh, got a few actors and a few band. To, uh, to play as if there was a war so that they could prove that they were tough and forceful. So this is not a new phenomenon, uh, mis mis misinformation and, and so on, but now it's just so overwhelming. And unfortunately, we've become lazy and sometimes we just do not check the facts. So this is really important. At, at the end of the day, if you, if, if you, uh, th this is also a, uh, a, a job for us mayors because we are on the ground, so it is a bit easier to simply uh, unmask some of those, uh, some of those lies, and simply, you know, point to 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 the truth and point to to reality, or to explain that uh, LGBT community is no threat to anyone, as some people want to portray it in in, in some of this populist propaganda, uh, and that there is so much. Uh, propaganda and so much lies spread about which have nothing to do with truth. And at the end of the day, it's easier for us because then I can say, come on, let's meet some of my friends. See, they're not, I'm not teaching masturbation. They're not uh, impinging upon f family values. Let, let's talk about that, you know? And, and, and it's, 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 it's much easier when, when you're with the people to actually try to uh, attack some of those myths and, uh, some, and, and unmask some of the propaganda. It's so true because also your jurisdiction deals with issues that are less abstract, right? So the, the proof is there. Like, you know, you're filling a pothole or you're getting the lights on the street or, or whatever. So that is is an easier way to tackle and, with and truth. And you can always, you know, I mean, it's easier because you are, if I may, uh, uh, 
submit that to you, you, you are more credible. You know, I run 11 hospitals and I was, uh, you know, uh, I was uh, in one of them with COVID and I, I needed, uh, I needed, you know, oxygen and so on. And I was seeing, I'm 50 and I was seeing guys were like 35, you know, fit and, and so on being rolled out dead from the same hospital. So I could relate to my own experiences, not only as a patient, but as a guy responsible for 11 hospitals to tell the people, listen, guys, come on, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Here are the numbers. Mm -hmm. Come, let's, let, let's see how it really works. If you don't vaccinate yourself, you're going to have probably a much more difficult illness ahead of you, because if you are vaccinated, then even if you get sick, you're not going to need, you know, uh, respirators and, 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 and the specialist help. Uh, ventilators uh, that 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 uh, that are necessary when you're not vaccinated. So you can point to real examples. It's 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 a bit easier to explain because those those stories happen to you. They happen to the people you employ. They happen to the people who are uh, your responsibility. So 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 it's, and, and yes, you are more credible because you are actually running those hospitals yourself. And you're part of the community. I mean, I think what the messenger is really important. And I think. It, it's members of trusted members of your community that deliver the message, not, you know, a national politician coming down and you know lecturing people about vaccines, but rather someone they trust that they know that they can see that's much more tangible. But even now, like we look at the refugee crisis, and, and of course everyone is focusing on what's happening in Poland because you know Warsaw alone has accepted 300,000 refugees from Ukraine, and people say why, how, and I tell them, even in Warsaw, I I, I point. To, to, to the city hall and to the old town, to all the buildings that we know so well. And I say, they were, Warsaw was destined to be, to be destroyed and to disappear from the map of Europe because Hitler said so. And it was raised to the ground. And look how incredible it is, how dynamic it is. Those buildings are standing because of this extraordinary will of the people. So we understand, I would, I would say much, much, much better what people of Kharkiv or Mariupol feel and think, because they were again, uh, uh, it is ordered to disappear by a maniac. Uh, so it is easier to relate, because you tell a story that people can see with their own eyes, and they can touch the buildings, and they can see the trees that, 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 that have been planted just after the Second World War. So it is, it is easier to relate to people. And again, when you're a mayor, you, you're with the refugees. So I'm with them, uh, I talk, I speak Russian, so it's a bit easier. We, we talk to them all the time. So, so whatever, w when we tell a story, it is, it's more convincing, not just because we are smarter or because we can use uh, the, the, the images in a better way, but because we have that uh, hands-on experience. If you are a minister or if you're a prime minister, you are just locked there with your security guards. There is nothing bad about it because it's obvious that you know the president needs to be uh, protected, right? But we cannot. We we need to be on the streets. So so our experience is is, is much more immediate. Mm -hmm. So that allows us to uh, to project that with with a certain degree of credibility, and I think that's the winning argument at the end of the day. And it's also empathy, right? I mean the, sure. that you have the empathy from your own experience, but also when you interact with people, you it's it's hard for people to to ignore face to face. It's easy to hide no, behind no, Twitter but, or But but you know, if you talk about the courage of the Ukrainian people, uh, if you talk about the resilience of the of, of, of the Ukrainians. I mean, if you tell a story when, you know, we are helping the refugees and suddenly I see those young guys, mm -hmm. you know, and they say, uh, "Mr. Mayor, can we take a sandwich?" And I say, "Yeah, but you're not a refugee, but if you you know, there's like we're helping refugees." No, 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 we are not. We are I've been traveling for 3 days because I'm, I'm going back to fight. Okay, and that's a story that opens your eyes. What kind of courage is this? That's that that you know those guys came from from f all the way back from Portugal because you know they decided to go back and help their 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 brothers and their fathers in in fighting for freedom, our freedom as well. Yeah. If you talk to, to to some of those people who who fled, and the first thing they say is like, Mr. Mayor, how can I find a job? Because I don't want to be dependent on anyone. You know, thank you for what you're doing to, to for us. But I want to be independent. I need to help my own community. Those are the stories that actually, uh, you, you know, carry such a emotional weight. Mm -hmm. 
that they immediately convince people that they also need to get their act together and start helping. You know, because you're telling true stories from life. And this is much more effective than just, you know, appeals to solidarity and goodness and geopolitical questions and so on. So, 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 so sometimes those arguments are, are, are winning just because we're there with the people and, and, and we know what, what courage and resilience it really, it, it really takes in order to find yourself in such an incredible situation. I think it speaks, yeah, the personal storytelling. Uh, I think that is also the way to break down barriers. You know, for example, as you mentioned, you know, if there is hostility towards LGBTQ community, for example, just listening to the stories of a, of a kid who grows up in an environment where they don't feel comfortable in their own skin, um, it's hard not to then tap into more empathy. But that's, you know, that's the most important thing to do. If you want to fight manipulation and you want to fight what's happening in, 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 in the social media, you need to have your own narrative. You need to have a story to tell. And that's, that's where we can make a difference. And I'm going to, uh, at the end, give you one example. We talk about fighting climate change. This is some of, one of the most important priorities of mine in the city of Warsaw. We're fighting climate change. We are fighting for clean air and so on and so forth. But then it turns out that you know, we're removing those coal-powered stoves in mm -hmm. one of the districts of Warsaw, which is the poorest district, where lots of um, underprivileged people live and so, and so on and so forth. And we had always the educational scores for young people were 20 percent lower and everyone thought it's because they're underprivileged it's because there are you know lots of families with problems blah 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 suddenly we connected many of those apartments to central heating and the educational scores go up yeah. why because those kids were cold mm -hmm. because they were missing school so suddenly you know you are addressing a problem of of climate change and and, and the purity of air but you're also fighting social exclusion and this is such a telling example that people start thinking okay and I tell them even if you do not believe in global warming I mean I'm not gonna convince you in 10 you 10, 10 in yeah but you believe in, 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 in making 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 people's uh, lives better you know quickly back to the um, situation that your Ukraine refugees in Warsaw is just remarkable uh, reception I mean as I understand people are people are taking refugees into their personal homes and uh, what what more do you need to make that uh, easier for your city to withstand? What can what can EU partners do, and how going forward? What lessons have you learned that can help other cities with with migration uh, issues as well? Again, the networks are incredibly important because we learn from one another. I just had my good friend uh, Mayor Imamoglu of uh, of Istanbul in Warsaw. So of course, you know we are friends. Uh, and he, he told me how they were dealing with their country number one when it comes to refugees population. Poland used to be 120th, now it's country number two in the world. So of course, immediately I have this, this feedback and information, but uh, more importantly, and that's the message that I want to convey here in the United States of America, that's why I'm meeting you, that's why I'm meeting uh, the people on the Hill, uh, Joe Biden's administration, because I, I want to tell them, listen, I mean, okay, some help might go to the central government. Mm -hmm. They're doing their bit, you know. But most of the work which is done in Warsaw and in Poland is done by ordinary people, by non-governmental organizations, by volunteers, by charities, and by local government. So you need to support us directly. Don't go, don't give all the money to the central government. Give the money to us. We are more accountable. We're going to give it to the NGOs. We know where the, 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 the money is needed. And, and, and I, I can give you hundreds of examples where concrete help is, is, is needed. For example, psychologists and psychiatrists. All of my psychologists and psychiatrists work with refugees. And my kids need psycho psychologists and psychiatrists after two years of COVID, of online learning, after this, this vicious attack of, of, of this crazy populist government in Poland on the LGBT community. We need our psychologists and psychiatrists. So just by helping us resolve that one problem, by helping us get more psychologists, more uh, psychiatrists who know how to work with people who are traumatized by war, we can resolve one of the most important problems. That's so true. And I think your point that you're delivering, the message you're delivering here is really important because I think we, we too often like to label countries, um, you know, that, that country undemocratic and it's like the door is shut. And we need to make <coughs> sure that the door is open for cities, for Democrats that are 
that are, that are living there and that they need our support because they're the only way to get two change. Ima <laughs> two images. One <laughs> image from, you know, three, three months back that Poland was an undemocratic country not worth taking care of, investing, and so on. Not true. Because we have a strong civil society, strong NGOs, strong democracy in Poland, regardless of the populist government. Exactly. Another image of today. Poland is great, wonderful solidarity. This government has cleaned its hands in this <laughs> solidarity effort. Not true. Right. This is done by the people. This is done by the NGOs. And of course the government is doing its bid when it comes to helping refugees. And they are doing a good job where they can. But that doesn't mean that they're not undermining democracy, that they're stopped undermining the rule of law, that they're not attacking independent institutions and so on and so forth. So it's never, at least from... Uh, from the ground up, it's never such a clear story. It's always more complicated than that. And, and I'm here to tell the story. Absolutely. Uh, nuance. <laughs> not black no. and white. It doesn't sell well on social media. No, today. no, it doesn't. It's not very simple. Um, well, I know I have to let you go, but are there any other main messages that you have for your trip here to D.C.? The most important thing is that the Ukrainians are, are not fighting only for their freedom, they're fighting for our freedom. And I'm not talking about Poland. Uh, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the whole Western world. Because Putin wanted to destabilize all of us. He wanted to weaken all of us. And when we look at the Ukrainians who are sacrificing their life, fighting for the values that we hold dear, that's the moment to stop and think. If they're willing to die for those values, we have to do everything we can to strengthen them and to fight for them. And it's no time to say, oh, Hungary, you know, they lost the election, so we are not going to help them because they're different. Oh, oh, Poland, oh, it's difficult because of the crazy populist government. We just witnessed an election in France mm -hmm. where we were not sleeping for two or three weeks. <laughs> Finally, we, we, Macron won, but, but it, it was close. Everyone in the United States should go back to, uh, to, to, to a year ago on, on, on the Capitol and, and Democracy is incredibly fragile, fragile, and if people are willing to die for it, we need to make everything we can in order to defend those values and uphold the things that are dear to us by doing what? By helping people on the ground, mm -hmm. civil society, non-governmental organizations, all the people who simply try to help the dispossessed and those who have it more difficult than we do. A hundred percent. I. Ukraine's democracy is all of our democracy, and it Indeed. needs to be defended. And it was such a pleasure to have you Thank here. You. Thank you for taking the time to visit us here at GMF. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks. Super.